Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ironman Florida 2022 course preview. My name is Reem Jishi. I'm the content director for QT2 Systems. And um, with us today is our presenter, Coach Jackie Miller. Jackie is a coach and an athlete with QT2 Systems. And I can't think of anyone that's more qualified to give this course preview than Jackie is. She's um, done the race. This will be her fourth year racing um, the full. She's also raced the half at Panama City. And um, she has been on the course either as a coach, an athlete, or as a spectator since 2008. So she knows the ins and outs of the course, the logistics, anything that you are going to face on race day. So um, I'll go ahead and um, introduce... Let Jackie take over now. Hey guys, thanks for joining us tonight. I know um, we're all tapering down and everybody's probably pretty tired tonight. So we'll try to make this as brief as possible. And uh, hopefully you guys can walk away with some information for race day, which is just in two and a half weeks now. So um, Reem, we had a little technical difficulty. So Reem is going to uh, be sliding through the uh, slides for us. So you can go ahead and advance Reem. Um, this is what we're going to cover tonight. We're going to just go through our QG2 systems, five cornerstones, um, going into the final weeks, which are right now, and then the week of race, um, and then race day. Go ahead. These are our QG2 five cornerstones. This is how we base our uh, coaching philosophy, our methodologies around, we believe that five, there are five very important cornerstones to any um, important, like successful outcome in a race. The first two is preparation, which is training and your nutrition and restoration followed by your race execution, which is fueling at the event and your race pacing. And then the fifth one is your mental fitness or how positive you can remain on race day, how you get through those tough spots. And all five of these things, um, contribute to your race or your event outcome. And we're going to be talking a little bit about each of the five cornerstones tonight in each um, of the three um, race week and race day. So the final weeks, which we're in right now, we have two and a half weeks till race day. Um, what we should be doing right now is we should have pretty much already peaked out on our run and bike volumes. We usually peak athletes out about three to six weeks, depending on the athlete, their durability, their history, um, experience, and what type of athlete they are. So that's kind of how we base our taper scheme. So right now, most of us are kind of entering or have already entered into taper. Um, we try to simulate, we want to try to simulate race conditions and intensities during training on these final weeks. Um, try to practice in your wetsuit if, if able. It looks like it's pretty much going to be a wetsuit swim. Ride and run in your race kit that you're going to wear on race day and your shoes sunglasses, all the things, and definitely practice um, how you're going to transport your fueling. A lot of you may be using fuel from, from the course, which does make it logistically a lot easier, but some of you may be carrying your own products. And, and if you are doing that, you definitely want to figure it out all out, how you're going to carry all the gels, your bottles, your refills, et cetera. Um, you also want to do a dress rehearsal ride. So this is, um, going out on your bike, making sure you're testing all your gears and equipment. Um, this, you know, before your bike tune up and after your bike tune up. So also um, you should be making sure you've already scheduled your bike tune up. If you haven't already scheduled your race tune up for your bike, make sure you do so ASAP. Like as soon as you're off this tomorrow morning, call your bike shop and schedule that tune up. You want to make sure after you get your bike tuned up that you go ahead and do one or two more rides, at least on the bike, just to make sure everything's working properly. All right. Um, the final weeks, nutrition and restoration. These are very important weeks to make sure you're getting your fluid intake. Um, this should be at least half of your body weight in addition to what is lost during your workouts. You should really make sure you're focusing on high nutrient foods, four to six uh, daily servings of fruit and vegetables each day. You really want to pile on the uh, on the good uh, pile in the good food in your body because this is all contributing to, um, you know, keep the calories. You know, as the ta as you start tapering down, you also kind of want to taper your food down because you know on those weeks where we're training 15 to 20 hours and we're needing a lot of extra calories, and then you're 
weekly volume drops to say 10 to 12 hours, obviously you're gonna cut your calories down a little bit as well, but you wanna keep the nutrients up. Um, on the evening to uh, prior to your long training sessions, you do want to have a replenishment meal. So that night before, obviously your long rides aren't as long as they once were, but you still wanna have a nice replenishment meal the night before, um, which is a little bit higher in carbs, lower in fat, you're still fuel, fully fueling all your workouts. And what's really important, especially, is making your sleep a priority right now, at least seven to eight hours per night, because as you get closer to race day, you're going to have a lot of anxiety. You're going to be very nervous. So you're going to make sure you don't start race week with a sleep deficit. Make sure you're using a recovery drink after all of your um, workouts and take some anti-inflammatory measures such as omega-3s. Um, keep hydrated, try to reduce your mental stress if that's possible. And again, increase your sleep and watch your diet. Uh, you want to start slowly tapering down your caffeine. If you take, you know, you drink a lot of coffee, a lot of soda, anything like that. Um, try to target less than 800 milligrams per week. This will make your caffeine gels on race day a little bit more, um, give you a little bit more boost, I guess you could say. All right, moving on. For the final weeks of fueling, you wanna still continue to fuel in accordance with your plan during every session. So, you know, if, if you're on one bottle per hour of Gatorade Endurance and a gel every 30 minutes, you wanna keep continuing that through taper. You might not need all those calories, but you still wanna keep your body used to taking in on the timing of your nutrients. Um, this is just basically training your gut for race day, getting used to taking, Again, using the one bottle per hour and a gel every 30 minutes example, you want to just keep that pattern going so your body's used to it and you also are used to it. On race day, your fueling is most likely the most important limiter or the most important thing for performance. So all the training you've done for the past six to 12 months, um, if you're not fueling properly on race day, all of that can just go down the tube. So you really want to make sure on race day that you're sticking with your fueling plan. That's the one thing that you can really control on race day. The final weeks, you should really be practicing your specific training, um, whether you use heart rate or power or both, or you're using rate of perceived exertion or run pace, you really want to hone in on what these targets are going to be for race day and really practice these in these next couple weeks. the final weeks for mental fitness. So this is really being positive and having a strong mind is just as important as um, our physical training and our fueling or nutrition. Um, race day is a lot of mental strength to get through, especially um, those final miles of the run. So right now you wanna try to begin reducing external pressures as best as you can. So this is, you know, obviously, hard if you have a stressful job or you have a lot of family obligations, but if there's any way you can reduce, you know, maybe if you're volunteering at your child's school, maybe cut back on that. Or um, maybe if you can't take on any, try not to take on any new big projects at work right now, just try to reduce the pressures as best as you can. Now is a good time to begin vis visualization of the race. So there's different ways you can visualize, visualize, visualize um, you want to also you want to visualize your best performance strategy. So you, the couple ways you can visualize is you looking outwardly on the course and you performing um, the race, or you can do it from a bird's eye view of like you're looking down upon yourself performing on race day. So you want to pr uh, practice your visualization of being very strong, having a very successful day, starting like dipping your toes in the sand at the swim start the swim all the way through T1, all the way through the bike, all the way through T2, the run, the finish line, visualize, you know, fast forward through your whole day in a successful manner, but also coping imagery. When the, when the times get tough on the run, when you enter into the dark times of, I don't think I can finish this, or I really just want to walk the rest of this. What are your coping methods? What is your, what, what, what is, what was your, why, why did you sign up for this race in the first place? Remember those things and visual, visualize those as well. And then also obviously just being successful throughout the day. 
um, list your goals and targets. It's really good to write these down. I always advise athletes to write down their goals um, and their target times. Uh, you can do like your realistic times and also your, um, your stretch goals. If this is your first race, I wouldn't advise writing any times down at all. Just, you know, maybe some goals of I'm going to finish this one with a smile on my face. I'm going to be strong on the bike, but try to stay away from time goals. If this is your first Ironman and just be a little bit more vague, but writing these down and putting them somewhere, I always tell people to put them on their bathroom mirror and the dashboard of their car, someplace where they're going to see them every day from now until they're heading into race day. And then finally, internalize those race specific workout feel. So just how does it feel? How's the, you know, how's race feel? How does these, how do these final workouts imagine the night before you have your last long ride? How's that ride going to feel the next day? Um, just internalizing those workouts. Logistically, um, these, these last few weeks, you want to make sure you're reading through the athlete guide that has been put out already. Again, make sure your bike is tuned up, make your packing list, purchase anything you need now. So for example, I wrote down today, I need a new aero bottle. So I need to make sure I order that ASAP. Um, get your, if you're going to use gels that aren't on the course or fluid that's not on the course or food items, um, get all that stuff now and start making piles. Start packing, like making little piles in your bedroom. Just, you know, here's my swim stuff. Here's my bike stuff. You can never be too prepared. And then also eventually, um, actually, I think it's changed this year. In the past, uh, we get an e we used to get an email from active.com uh, with a QR code, but I think this year is new. The first time post-COVID is we just show up um, at check-in. So whenever you get there to Panama City, if you get there Wednesday afternoon, you just go straight to check-in. And that's, you don't need the um, email thing anymore. I don't think that's exact from what I've been hearing. So um, I would advise checking in as early as possible. The, the earlier you check in, the less the lines are. It is an outdoor check-in. So the last thing you want to do is, is wait till the last minute on Thursday. Check-in is Wednesday and Thursday and be standing there at four o'clock on Thursday in a long line in the hot sun. And then make sure you confirm your reservations for your condominium or your hotel um, any rent-a-cars, anything like that. And this is moving in now to race week. So this is, um, you know, we're a couple, two and a half weeks out. So starting Monday of race week, um, you're going to get there. You're going to get these gear bags. This is um, what your gear bags are, your morning clothes bag, your bike gear bag, your run gear bag, special needs and run. Um, actually, it's now called bike personal needs and run personal needs. So uh, we'll move along. We'll talk about what we're going to put in each one of these. So in your morning clothes bag, this is what you're going to carry to your swim start with you. So normally it's pretty chilly in Panama City in November in the morning. Um, I've been there as low as 38 degrees, which was actually last year. Um, but there has been a few other years where it's 38 degrees in the morning and windy and cold to 65 degrees where and muggy and it's very warm and you're sweating in the morning. So be prepared for any kind of weather for fall in Panama City. But the morning clothes, so if you were to wear like say sweats, sweats um, to the swim start and you're carrying your wetsuit in your hand, this morning clothes bag is where you'll put those clothes. Um, you'll put your wetsuit, your goggles, your anything you need for the swim in this bag. And then when you get ready to start the swim, you take all your swim gear out, put it on, and then you put your sweat shirt and your sweatpants into this morning clothes bag. If you have a Sherpa there, you can give this bag to them and they can take it back to the condo and you can never see it again, or they can bring it to the finish line and that can be your clothes for post-race. If you do not have a Sherpa there, there is a check-in table um, around the swim start where you'll check this bag and then you get it back after you finish. So this is everything you need for the swim. I would also advise in this bag, making sure the night before to put your pre-swim gel and a little bottle of um, water or electrolyte drink to sip on.
The next bag you get is your swim to bike bag. In this bag, you're going to um, put anything you need for the bike portion. This bag will also be the bag you dispose all of your swim gear in. So I always like to streamline my, um, my transitions. I, in my mind, I always say methodical execution, no decisions allowed. So I don't put anything in my bags that allow me to make a decision. Like maybe I'll put, uh, maybe I want to wear this jersey or maybe I want to wear that jersey, but I'm going to put them both in there and I'll decide on race day. Don't do that. Just put exactly what you need in there. You, you don't want to be sitting in the changing tent deciding what outfit to put on. So in this bag, you're going to put in your, for example, your rate, your bike helmet, your bike shoes. If you're going to wear socks, your sunglasses, a small towel, body glider, chamois butter. If you're going to have a snack or gel after the swim and definitely sunscreen because the sun is very intense in Panama city. Um, I also personally, this is just my own little thing. I like to put a Ziploc bag with a wet, um, soapy washcloth in there. And I do a quick, 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 like starting with my face to my arms, to my legs, wiping off the uh, salt water. So it just prevents the shaping. There is uh, some shower heads you'll run under when you get out of the swim. Uh, so if you don't want to pack the washcloth in the Ziploc, make sure you get the salt off. This is one way to ensure shaping is if you uh, start the bike, you know, you leave the salt water on you all day long. So um, once you get your bike stuff on, then you will put your swim stuff into this bag and then the volunteers will take it out and put it back um, where your bags go. All right. Bike personal needs. Um, this is a bag that will be approximately on this course around mile 50-ish, somewhere between 50 and 56. Um, you don't have to stop at special needs or personal needs. The new name is personal needs, um, but you can. This is anything you might want, extra nutrition, a special snack. Um, even if you're not gonna stop, I would still advise putting like a couple spare tubes and CO2 cartridges in there just in case you flat it on the first 56 and then you don't have any backup um, tubes or CO2, just throw them in there into your bag just as a, just in case maybe some more sunscreen, maybe some more body glide, whatever you think you might want. And again, you don't have to stop here. This is purely optional. And um, yeah, just kind of this is a whatever you want to put. Some people like to put little motivational notes from their family members to read if they're having a tough time to kind of for motivation. It's just your own little personal stop. Your next bag is bike to run bag. This will be in T2. So T2, obviously you're coming off the bike, you're starting the run. So in this bag, you'll start, you'll have all your run gear. And then again, just as in the other bag, you put your run stuff on and you put your bike stuff into this bag. So in this bag will be whatever you need for the run. I also, again, put another Ziploc bag with a wet cloth because get all the, um, road dirt grime off you just a quick 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 wash and, that, and it makes you feel fresh starting the run a little towel if you want to towel off you're definitely your race belt with your number attached that's mandatory on the run your running shoes any body glide a visor fresh socks um, any nutrition you might need that's not going to be on the course I sometimes will like to put a fresh pair of sunglasses in here so if my sunglasses get all grimy on the bike I have a, a clear pair on the um for the run. And then um, again, your helmet, your bike shoes, et cetera, et cetera, will go into this bag and then the volunteers will take it back out. The changing tents are really nice and they are back this year. They've been gone a you know, couple years with COVID, but they are back. The volunteers and the changing tents are super helpful. Usually, um, you know, a volunteer will come right up to you with your bag and, and they'll dump it out for you and they'll say, what do you need? Can I help you put your shoes on? Um, can I help you do anything? And then they normally will put the stuff back in the bag for you um, and carry it back out. So, but regardless, even if you don't have someone right in front of you, you just leave your bag in the changing tent and the volunteers will carry it out. You do not take your bag back to the um, bag area. And then at mile 13, you have your run special or personal needs. And again, this is whatever you want to put into it. Um, again, you do, I didn't mention this before, but you do not get these bags back. So don't put a pair of brand new running shoes that cost 
$200 into this special needs bag that maybe you might want a second pair of shoes at mile 13, you may not get this bag back. So this is stuff that you're, you're fine if it gets donated to charity, if it gets thrown away. Again, special snacks, extra nutrition, highly recommend a thin, warm, long sleeve tech shirt um, because a lot of times it does tend to get chilly after the sun sets, which is pretty early because it's fall and uh, the sun is probably going to set between 5 and 5.30. So a long sleeve shirt to put on at, after dark and um, glow tape sometimes is required. So this can be just a pre-stuck onto your shirt you can do it the night before you put it into your bag, just some little pieces of glow tape, you know, on your shoulders or on the sleeves of the shirt. Um, you could also put a glow stick necklace in there, any band-aids, biofreeze, ibuprofen, extra socks, anything like that would be in this bag. But again, nothing that you don't mind getting thrown away. Race week training. These are your final sessions. Um, they should be very short specific to the race um, or very easy. So maybe, you know, some little short little intervals of race pace or just complete recovery workouts and they should be kept very short. This is just to keep the blood flowing. We're obviously not gaining any fitness on race week. We're just trying to keep things limber, keep the, keep the blood flowing. Um, this is not a time to get any last minute training in or panic train like, oh my gosh, I feel like I haven't done enough. I, I feel like I really feel like I need to get one more three hour run in. This is not the time to do this. It is better to go into a full Ironman slightly undertrained than overtrained. So um, just don't do any of anything crazy on race week. All right. Um, new, race week, nutrition and, and recovery or restoration, as we call it. Again, just eat a pretty normal diet the week of the race. Um, if it's going to be a hot race, add a little extra salt to your meals, really stay hydrated. This really helps your, your blood plasma levels. It helps, you know, you don't want to go into a race dehydrated. Your performance can be decreased by about 30% if you're dehydrated on a race. So drink plenty of a uh, sports drink and water going in like the three days prior to the race. So starting Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, again, still tapering off that caffeine. So your caffeine is a little bit more effective on race day. Um, still consuming that recovery drink after every training session, just to get those glycogen stores replenished, um, really focus on getting good sleep this week and try to stay off your feet when you're not training. So you're just really trying to have a quiet week. You're resting, you're hydrating, eating good food, um, and just trying to keep the stress level very low. For fueling on race week, we kind of just really kind of said these things already. So again, hydrate, nutrient dense meals, start increasing your carbs a little bit on Wednesday um, and decreasing your fiber just so you don't have a lot of uh, bathroom problems on race day, increase your salt. We like to do with the, our core diet um, with QG2, we like to do a food taper. So on Friday, the day before the race, we like to eat a really big breakfast loaded up with carbs. So we call it our pancake breakfast. So a lot of pancakes, potatoes, a couple eggs for protein, some toast. And then um, you walk away from that meal almost feeling like sickly full. And then medium lunch, just, you know, like a half of a sub or a cup of rice with some protein, something bland medium size, and then a very light dinner. So we're trying to get our food um, all digested by race morning. So a light dinner would be something, you know, like maybe a little bit of rice, pasta, uh, chicken breast, or some salmon, just something very bland, nothing spicy, nothing crazy. Um, and you want to go to bed almost a little bit hungry. For race week on pacing. So um, you need to really make sure you have your pacing down in uh, by race, well, obviously a little bit before race week. So whether you're using heart rate or power, rate of perceived exertion or pace, this really should all be figured out before you get to this race week. For mental fitness of race week, again, you really want to reduce your external pressures, make, make sure you you're trying to have a relaxing, stress-free race, I mean, race week. Um, trust in your preparation. This is so important. So really at this point, of race week, there's nothing more you can do. The hay is in the barn, as they say. Uh, you 
you can't gain any more fitness. The only thing you do is hurt yourself by training too much and going into the race, um, tired. So really at this point, you've done what you can. There's nothing, you can't go back and say, wow, I wish I wouldn't have missed that long run five weeks ago. You just have to, it is what it is at this point. You've done what you can and you're ready at this point. You have to trust in your training. Continue your visualization like we've discussed before. Um, if it helps you to drive the bike course um, um, or bike the run course, just so you can get that visual of, of where you're going. And, and if there's any like little bit of hills or bumps in the road, anything like that, if that's going to make you feel better, then go ahead and do that. Make sure you continue with your logistics preparation. If you haven't read the athlete guide or you feel like you need to review it again, um, confirm your check-in times, make sure your bags are packed. So you're not stressing on that day before check-in and you're just starting your packing of your race day bags, make sure everything's charged your power meter, um, your, your watch, anything you're going to use on race day, make sure all that's charged when you have fresh batteries. If you have, you know, in your heart rate strap, a fresh battery, in your power meter, you've charged your DI2 shifters, all those things. So now we're at the end of race week. So these are the final days before the race, Thursday through Saturday, Saturday being race day. Um, logistically, this is specific to Panama City. So the check-in days are Wednesday and Thursday from 10 to five at Aaron Besson Park, which is at Pier Park. Um, you cannot check in on Friday. That is bike and gear bag drop off. You have to be in Panama City by Thursday before five o'clock to check in. Um, again, I put the QR code on here and, but we don't, I, we don't need those now. So this is from last year, um, the QR code, you will need your photo ID. So um, at this check-in, you'll get your little backpack, you'll get your timing chip, you'll get your race bib. And again, if you have any friends that you wanna be on a bike rack with, um, if you guys are all in line together, the way they do bibs now is they print them out in the order that, you arrive. So if you get there right at the start of Wednesday at 10 a.m., that's the start of check-in, you're going to get a lower bib number. So all world athletes will get the lowest bib numbers. And from that point, then whoever gets there first, you know, let's say you get there at 10 o'clock, maybe your bib 500. Okay. And then if your best friend is behind you and their bib 501 and your other friend is right behind that person, and they're 502, you guys are all going to be on the rack together. You want to try to attend an athlete briefing. This will go over any course changes. It'll go over, over any like road construction, anything to look at, look out for on race day. Um, just, just go through the course and, and just logistic stuff in general. Um, these briefings are Wednesday at 11 and two, Thursday at 11, one and two, and Friday at 11 and two. And these are held right in the area of check-in at Aaron Bassett Park. Bike and gear bag check-in Friday from nine to three at Pier Park in the West parking lot. Your personal needs will be dropped off on race morning. And lastly, you wanna familiarize yourself with transition, the layout and the flow. What I personally like to do is once I rack my bike, I kind of uh, walk it off several times. I walk, where am I coming in from the swim and how do I get to my bike from the swim? Where am I exiting the bike? Um, you know, where do I have to go? And then I look for landmarks of, for the rack. So, um, okay. My rack is right by this big tree or my rack is three racks down from the big tree. You want to try to find some kind of a landmark because you do come out of the water a little discombobulated. So you think like, oh, I'll remember what rack I'm on, but you don't always remember what rack you're on. So try to find some kind of landmark that you can just look for and run towards, um, to find your rack. All right, Friday night. So on Friday night, if they're not already, you should pack your personal needs bags because those are what you're going to be carrying in the morning to race day and you're going to drop them off. Set out your gear for race morning. Um, anything that you haven't dropped off with your gear bag. So this is whatever you're wearing, your tri kit, your swim cap, cap, your goggles, your wetsuit, the timing chip and any race day fueling products um, because we can't put fuel on our bike the night before, uh, such as fluid. So you can tape gels, things like that, but 
no, if you're going to have like a sandwich or something like that, I would not put that on your bike the night before. And you cannot put fluids on your bike the night before. Um, I like personally to put my timing chap timing chip inside my swim cap and then um, just kind of wrap everything up like in my wetsuit. So it's all in one place. So I don't forget anything. Um, I, I also will leave a little note on my condo door if there's anything I need to grab. So when I'm walking out the door, I'll see the note, like, make sure you have your wetsuit, make sure you have your, your Gatorade bottle, make sure you have your pre-swim gel, anything like that. Um, just because you think you're going to remember, but race morning, you're extremely nervous, obviously. So um, having a little note on the back of the door is, is very helpful. Um, you also on race morning, if you, um, have a Sherpa or, or you have some place to put things, you want to bring some clothing for after the race. You can also put the after race clothing in your morning clothes bag. So if you plan on hanging out and cheering friends in after you cross the finish line, you're definitely going to want a change of clothing because you're going to be in probably some damp, salty, gross clothes that you've worn all day that may or may not smell like pee. And you're not going to want to walk around in those. Um, so I would advise probably it's usually pretty chilly and you tend to be cold after an Ironman anyway. So maybe like a pair of lightweight sweatpants, um, obviously depending on the weather, sweatshirt, jacket, whatever. Um, and then some after race nutrition, those recovery drinks, maybe some money to go have someone buy you some food, anything like that. Um, Confirm your race morning logistics. So if you're meeting friends or you need to get a ride to the race start, anything like that, make sure that's all ironed out and definitely try it's as nervous as you are. And you're probably not going to sleep much. Try to get to bed early. Even if you're not sleeping, you're just kind of chilling down and relaxing. And then obviously set your alarm, um, set several alarms if you need to your phone, a clock, have a wake up call, anything like that. Race day check-in logistics. So transition opens at 445. It closes at 630. Um, transition is in Pier Park West. Um, there's plenty of parking in this, at the new venue now. So you don't really have to worry about um, not finding parking. At the old venue and boardwalk is very hard to find parking, but there's plenty. It's like a big, huge shopping area. So there's plenty of parking. Um, at 640, the national anthem will play. And at 645, the age group swim start will begin. It's a rolling start. Um, we'll cover that a little bit going forward. Um, the Iron Man store is open from 12 to 8. So um, if any of your family members want to go buy you presents, that's when they're going to do it. And then um, if you need bike support, they are open from uh, 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. And then you can check out um, your bikes and your gear bags anytime between 6.30 p.m. and 12.30 in the morning. So I highly advise if you do have a Sherpa or a family member, you're going to get a bike checkout ticket. Give that to one of your family members or your friends, have them get your bike and your gear bags, because the last thing you're going to want to do after you cross the finish line um, is worry about going and getting your bike and your gear bags. This way they can, you know, they'll see you pass by on the run, maybe on loop two, they run and get your bike and your gear bags, take it back to your hotel or your condo, and then they can come back out and still see you finish. And then once you finish, you're done. You don't have to deal with all that. Um, the race ends 17 hours after the last athlete enters the water. I think it's around 1240-ish, they said. Um, all right, so go ahead, Reem. Race day, nutrition, and restoration. So just, you know, as we talked about the food taper before, you want to have a really large dinner two nights before the race. So Thursday night and a large breakfast Friday morning. Um, and you want to try to eat this pretty early before 9 a.m. And that way you start your food taper like we discussed already. A large meal is considered to have 90 to 125 grams of carbs, 20 grams of protein, and less than 25 grams of fat. After breakfast on Friday, you're going to, again, taper your food down. Your last meal should be light so that you almost go to bed a bit hungry. This is kind of repetitive. I already said this earlier. Sorry about that. Um, taper your food, continuing to hydrate really well on that on Friday. Um, eat your dinner early so your belly is not full when you go to bed. Uh, definitely avoid caffeine. And just try to keep your legs up throughout the day. This is should be a relaxing day. I mean, it gets a bit busy with checking in your bike and your gear bags. But once that's done, I would advise trying to do that pretty early in the day. Don't wait till the last minute, get it done, you know, fairly early and come back to your condo 
hang out. It's a good day to watch a movie, look at magazines, read a book, just do very relaxing things on Friday. The morning of race day. So Saturday, you're going to keep your breakfast, um, simple carbs, some good fluid, some Gatorade endurance or whatever electrolyte drink, scratch, whatever you drink, um, a little bit of protein. So we have our core diet recommended race day breakfast is applesauce, which is kind of based upon your weight. Um, so usually anywhere from a cup and a half all the way up to three cups, depending on your body size, a banana and one scoop of, of whey protein or whatever protein you like to use. Um, I always tell athletes if they can't handle um, protein powder, just some egg whites. Um, those are pretty easy to digest. The, the yolks can sometimes come back on you, but the egg whites are pretty simple on the stomach. And then you're going to sip on an electrolyte drink um, after breakfast all the way up until when you get to that swim start. Try to eat your race morning breakfast three hours prior to race start. So the age group start at 6.45. So let's just say you're going to start at seven. So you want to make sure three hours back from seven is when you're eating that breakfast. You want to bring a gel to, to ingest about 15 to 20 minutes before you get into the water. Also make sure you bring like one of those little tiny um, small serving water bottles to just sip on um, to take your gel down. And that will come to the swim start with you. Your parking again is at Pier Park. The um, transition, we kind of actually already covered this. So um, swim warm up. Sometimes they allow it, sometimes they don't. It's really good to try to get a warm up in the water if you can. It's just less shocking to your system when you um, do get into the water. If you can't get into the water, do something to get your heart rate up. Do like some arm swings, a little bit of jumping jacks. And again, make sure you apply that sunscreen. Race day feeling, this guys, this can make you or break your day. Um, you can do all the training in the world. And if you don't focus on getting, getting those calories in and that hydration in, your day can go south really fast. So make sure, obviously you've been practicing with whatever it is you're going to use. You've been, you know, drinking a God awful amount of Gatorade or scratch or whatever it is you drink, um, to the point of puking, right? Um, so make sure you're following whatever you've been doing in training. If you're using what's on course, great. You don't have to carry anything. If you're not, make sure you've, you, you're loaded up with whatever you need. Um, put extra in your personal needs bags in case you drop anything, you lose anything. Always have a backup plan. Um, definitely, it's very easy to lose some gels out of your pocket and, and then you're short if you're not using what's on the course. So have a plan and have a backup plan. Consume extra fluids the first hour of the bike. So you can take a lot of extra calories in on the bike because you're not jostling your stomach around. So make sure you're getting those calories in on the bike because um, you can take more in on the bike than, than what you can on the run. So I always say like the bike is a vessel to ensure a good run and, and you want to really make sure you're hydrating and you're getting those gels down or your calories, whatever food you're taking in. Uh, more so on the bike because the run gets a little bit more tough to get get food items down. The aid stations on this course are every 18 miles on the bike and every one to one and a half miles on the run. What is served on the bike? We have water, Gatorade Endurance, orange, um, the Martin Gels 100 and the caffeinated gels 100. Um, we have the quantum bars and we have bananas. On the run, we have water, we have Gatorade Lemon Lime, we have Red Bull, we have Coke and then the gels again. We have the quantum bars. We have potato chips, pretzels, bananas, oranges, grapes, chicken broth after dark. And at mile one, we have active ice, which is just if it's hot. Also have um, additional sodium on board. One thing with the Martin gels is they're actually fairly low in sodium compared to like the Gatorade gels or the power gels. They are pretty low in sodium. So if you are planning on using the Martin gels, um, and if, even if you're using regular gels, make sure you have what salt tabs or whatever kind of sodium choice you're using, just have some backups on your body and your pockets. And here we go. This is just a picture of um, the gels and what they contain. Again, um, they're lower in sodium than most gels. So you can see they have 22 milligrams versus 200 milligrams. What 
of sodium in most gels, and they're very high in caffeine. So those caffeinated gels will really uh, will really get you going if um, you're used to the normal caffeinated gels. These are much higher in caffeine. Oh, and somebody gave me the tip once on the gels. Um, the white ones are the ones that contain caffeine and you just remember like white lightning. So those, the white ones are the ones that have the caffeine. So if you're kind of running through and just grabbing, um, remember if you grab the white lightning, that's the caffeinated ones. All right, so now we're getting into course logistics. So the swim, um, it starts again at 6.45. This swim is two loops. And um, there is a beach run in between. The sand can be packed or it can be very soft and sugary. Um, this is the Gulf. So it can contain currents or riptide. So um, last year there was a pretty good current. They were swimming against it. You, you really can't tell. This swim is different every year. Sometimes it's flat, sometimes there's waves. If there are big waves when you're heading out, I would advise to try not to go over the waves. You kind of want to dive underneath the water, under the waves, and you won't feel them um, quite as much. If you get caught in a riptide or a strong current, don't panic. You have to remain calm and just keep swimming until you get out of that riptide. It's, it's really more of a panic thing than anything. You just have to, if you remain calm and continue to swim, you're going to eventually swim out of it. So, um, that's my best advice there. You may see marine life. Um, I can almost promise you you're not going to see sharks, but maybe um, some jellyfish. They're usually pretty far down. The water is usually pretty clear up here. So even if you see the jellyfish, usually they're down lower, but you can um, encounter some jellyfish. You might get a little zap or two from them. I would advise tinted goggles. You are swimming um, at one point, you are swimming kind of into the direct sunlight when you're coming back into the shore, especially on the first loop. The swim cutoffs for the first loop is at an hour and 10 and the full swim, you have to have the 2.4 completed by two hours and 20 minutes. Wetsuits are legal at 76.1 and below. Usually this swim is wetsuit legal, not always, okay? Um, this is a self-seated rolling start. So what does this mean? If you are, this is your first race and you have never um, done a self-seated rolling start, what happens is there will be um, pacers. If you've done a running road race and you try to stay with a pace group, there's people with signs holding up that says under one hour, one hour to 110. 110 to 120, 120 to 130. And then after that, it goes by the 15 minute mark. So it's 130 to 145, 145 to two, and then two to 220. So you probably have a pretty good idea, or if you have a coach, your coach will have a pretty good idea of where to go in the self-seated start. So if you think it's going to take you an hour and a half to swim, don't go in the 110, you know, the one to 110 group, because you are going to get swam on top of by the people who are faster than you and very competitive. So um, really try to be honest about where you're placing yourself. You know, if you think you're gonna swim, uh, you know, like in the, you wanna go in the 120 to 130 and you think you're gonna be more towards the 120, then go to the front of the group. So stand more close to the person that has the sign. So once the cannon goes off, it's not like there's a pause. It's just like the under one hour guy steps away, and those people file in. And then the one 10 to one, um, one to one 10 person with the sign, they'll step away and those people file in. So it's just a continuing slow filing into the water. Usually they have everyone in the water at about the 20 minute mark. Use the first, the first two to 300 meters are, you know, your heart rate's gonna be high. You're probably trying to swim a little fast. Your heart rate, um, your breathing is gonna be, probably out of control. You might feel like you're going to drown. Um, just know that the beginning of the swim is for most people, very scary. It's very nerve wracking. And eventually you're going to find space. Your breathing's going to settle down. Your heart rate's going to lower, and then you can just get into the groove and start swimming, but just be prepared for that initial, um, you know, being scared and having a heart, heart, uh, hard, fast breathing and a little bit of a panic attack. Um, use the other swimmers to try to draft off if you can. If you're comfortable with drafting, it definitely gives you a benefit. So 
try to stay off the feet of someone or off to the side of their hip, but do not um, try to tap their feet. That's it's bad manners and you might get kicked really hard if you do that. So stay behind them enough in their bubbles, but try not to tap their feet if you're drafting. Um, the buoys are approximately every 200 yards. Um, they're very big buoys. You can't, they're very, it's so much easier on race day to sight than when you're just out swimming on your own. So um, they're very well marked. There's different colors for the turn buoy. So let's say that the regular buoys are yellow and the turn buoys are orange. You know, when you get to the orange buoy that then it's time to make that turn. The turns usually can be pretty crowded. Um, so if you don't wanna be stuck in a crowd then just swim wide of the buoy and don't go close into the buoy if you don't wanna get um, banged in the head. Again, expect possibly some waves, some riptide, some sea life. This is salt water, it's the Gulf, it's not a lake. So the water's gonna be salty, It's um, but it's, it, it, you're actually more buoyant in the sea, salt water. So it's it's not bad. Just I would highly recommend trying to go out and practice a little bit in the days prior to the race, just to kind of get used to the water. Um, and on that beach run, you know, if, if, if you're being competitive, yeah, definitely, you know, do a little jog down the beach. If you're just trying to finish this race and keep the day fun and relaxing, it's fine to walk that little beach section. Um, just your choice, whatever your day is unfolding with. Uh, just a couple little swim tips. Um, just remember the starting line, whether this person, the, it's a pro or a super fast person or a middle of the packer or back of the packer, everyone's nervous. We're all scared. I mean, no one knows what's going to happen. Um, no one knows how their day is going to unfold. So everyone's scared and, and maybe a little teary eyed. So just, you know, it's fine. You just expect the nerves. Um, just some, take some deep breaths to relax and focus inwardly. Remember all the hard work that it took to get to having your toes in the sand here and um, just, you know, just try to enjoy the moment. Uh, just expect the, for again, expect the first several hundred yards are going to be super crowded. It's going to be rough. You're going to be getting banged into um, just try to expect that the second loop, everyone becomes more spaced out and uh, you ha you can have some open space. If you don't want to draft, if, if it's more um, open water. And also by that point, by the second loop, the water becomes almost like a whirlpool. So the current starts going in the direction that you're swimming because so many people have been swimming, swimming in that direction by that point. Um, when you're heading into the shore, the sun is most likely going to be in your eyes. You can use the condos to sight off of if you can't see the buoys very well. The condos are straight ahead and they're tall. So just use those. Um, try to draft as much as possible. Like I said, it does give you an advantage. If it's a rough water kind of day, try again, I said this, don't swim over the waves or through the waves, dive under the waves. Um, and at the end of the swim, I personally like to start visualizing what I need to do. So start kicking a little bit quicker and lighter to get the blood flow back to the legs versus up in your arms and just start picturing through like, okay, I'm gonna get out of the water. I'm going to unzip my wetsuit. I'm gonna take it down to my waist. I'm gonna take my swim cap and goggles off. I'm gonna find a wetsuit peeler. And then I'm going to get to my bike bag and what do I need to do um, when I get to the changing tent? Just kind of start visualizing what you need to do. It is a long run to T1, so don't blow it out here. It's not a sprint. Um, you have a long day ahead of you, so don't um, get out of the water and start sprinting over to Pier Park because it's just not going to end well for you. All right, the bike. Um, so the course overview. It's one loop, which is kind of like unheard of an Ironman these days. They've been doing multiple loops. So this is one of the courses left that just has one huge loop. It's mostly flat. Um, for Floridians, we would not call it flat. For someone from um, upstate New York, they're going to say it's flat. But there are definitely some false flats. Um, there are some a little bit of inclines. And there's one large bridge or causeway that you have to pass over. Um, twice. So on your way out and on your way back. This course is always windy, no matter what. So um, expect the wind. And I, I mean, there's been years where you think like, oh, as soon as I make this turn, I'm finally going to get a tailwind. And then you finally make that turn. And nope, it's still a headwind because the wind has shifted or I don't know why, but it seems like you're always in a headwind. 
Um, it's especially windy by the condos. It's almost like a wind tunnel because you have tall condos on, this is on um, Front Beach Road when you're starting out and when you're ending. The condos are tall on both sides. So it almost makes it like a wind tunnel. Um, so your bike is most likely going to be blown a little bit to the side in this area. So just try to stay, um, if you, you know, if you feel uncomfortable getting blown around a little bit, try to stay off your arrow bars, be very aware, pay attention. Don't use this time to zone out and start thinking of other things. Just be very conscientious near the condos. Um, on this course, it's easy to really stay in your arrow bars for pretty much the whole course. Um, because you're not really doing any big climbs where you're going to be up out of your saddle. So the problem here is that your lower back and your hip flexors may start to get a little achy. So I would advise um, staying arrow as much as possible, but also um, standing up and stretching those hip flexors a little bit, stretching the glutes, pushing your butt back a little bit to stretch everything out um, just so you don't start cramping up. Because this course is one loop, it um, there's very few spectators once you get out on the course. So it can get quite quiet and lonely. So it's just time to focus inwardly and, and grind it out. Remember why you signed up for this race in the first place and just and just gut it out till mile 112. Um, mile 60 to 80 is an out and back. This is basically the whole part. If you've ever done the Gulf Coast 70.3, um, this is the course for 70.3. I don't know um, if you can see my little arrow, this right here, this out and back here is the golf course. And there is a big, um, not a big, sorry, a, a significant, you're going to notice the climb um, coming out to this turnaround. It is an incline. And then you make this U-turn here and then you're coming down a, a slight, a bit of a decline. So that is one part. You're definitely going to have a little bit of a climb. All right. And wind as well. <laughs> Um, for your pacing, so we all use different methods of pacing. Some of us are a little more tech, you know, techy, and others kind of a little bit more old-fashioned. So, um, on your uh, heart rate, you want to try to start a little bit easier for the first 56 miles, and then on that second um, 56 miles, you can have your heart rate can be about two to three beats higher than the first half. So let's just say, you know, your target for the first 56 miles is 130 heart rate. Um, beats per minute. So on the second half, you're going to want to try to, you know, 132 to 133. If you're using power, um, this is a really good course to execute very even power. Um, you still want your second half to be slightly higher just because, um, you know, we're progressing. We're getting a little bit faster as we go along. We don't want to, it's better to kind of end stronger than start strong and, and die out at the end. Um, the first 10 to 12 miles are super easy to overdo because you know, you're excited. You got you. Yay. I finally made it through the swim. That was the scary part. I'm, I'm on my bike. This is my favorite part, but there's going to be a lot of dodos. I'm um, just like, like flying by you. Like they're doing a sprint race. So that's fine. Let them fly by you because either they're super fast and they're just a lot faster than you, or they're just dumb. And, you know, 50 miles down the road, you're going to be passing them back by and kind of giving a little giggle like ah, You just blew it out in the first 10 miles. So just, you know, stay in your own race, do your own thing. This is your day. It's, you can't worry about everybody else around you. Um, pacing, just try to think, um, staying, keeping your speed as steady as possible. Um, any surge burns one of your matches. And at the end of the bike, you want as many matches left in your match book as possible. What does burning a match mean? So, you know, let's, let's say, you know, Sally Sue passes you by and you're like, oh no, girl, you're not passing me. I'm going to pass you back. So you give, you know, a quick little minute sprint past this person back. That's a match because now you just, you know, you increased your heart rate, you increased your power, you like blew out your speed, even that one little minute, all those little minutes add up at the end. So you want to try to just keep, you know, keep a steady pace, keep a steady power, keep a steady heart rate and just you know, again, stay in yourself. If you're going into a headwind, which I promise you at some point you will be, if it's not the whole 112 miles, you want to try to use a little bit of a higher cadence and think of like spinning into the wind, spin into the wind. If you have a tailwind, hopefully we will at some point, um, you want to use a lower cadence and you think of it as free speed. So like drop your cadence down a little bit, use a little bit, you know, use that power and just let it push you along. 
If you're using a rate of perceived exertion, this is a pace you know you can hold all day. You want to be able to have a, hold a conversation. Um, and again, like I always tell myself, my bike is whatever I do on my bike is going to affect my run. It's my vessel to having a good run. So I'm going to make sure I fuel properly. I'm going to make sure I pace properly. And all those things are going to set up um, my run for me. Um, stay ahead of fueling because it's really hard if you fall behind. You're, it's really impossible to catch back up. So stay on a good pattern. You know, if you're on a gel every 30 minutes, make sure you don't forget. Like I like to set my Garmin um, timer for a time and I, my watch will go off every 30 minutes to remind me to do a gel. So it's easy to lose track when you're on the course and all of a sudden you're kind of like, wait, did I do a gel at mile 10 or did I not? Because, you know, it's a long day. So try to set a timer on your watch to remind you when you need to do your nutrition. And our little core diet rule is on an Ironman course. You want to make sure you pee at least twice during the bike portion. So this just ensures hydration for the run. So it can be more than twice, but you want to pee at least twice. Um, bike penalties. Hopefully no one, no one on this um, call will get a bike penalty, but if you, if you, you know, there's motorcyclists out there, those are the referees. If they come up and they hand you a blue card, they'll say, they'll call your number out and they'll be like, number 512, you have a blue card for drafting or number 512, you have a blue card for whatever your, you know, your, your violation is. So you, for drafting, you have to keep six bike lengths between um, the person's front wheel and the rear, uh, the rear wheel and the cyclist in front of you. If you're going to pass, you need to pass on their left and complete your pass within 25 seconds. If you do not, and you're just riding next to someone and you, you know, like you all of a sudden realize, oh, wow, they're riding the same speed and I really can't pass them. And you're, and it's taking you longer than 25 seconds. You can get a penalty for blocking. So if you're for some reason not able to make your pass, you need to drop back behind them again, and then also make sure you're dropping six bike lengths back. If you get three blue cards, you get a red card, and this is disqualification. Please don't let that happen. You know, you don't want a whole year of training to come down to getting disqualified on race day. If you do get a blue card, you will stop at the very next penalty tent. These are scattered up along the course. So... I seen it as soon as you see the yellow penalty tent, if you did get a blue card for drafting, they've called your number out. You will stop at the penalty tent um, for drafting. It's five minutes and they will mark your bib with a line and you'll have to just stand there and hold a timing watch until five minutes is up. And then you get back on your bike and you take off. If you're blocking, it's a yellow card. That's 30 seconds um, at the next penalty tent. If you litter on the course, you're automatically disqualified. So you'll see in the um, aid stations, it'll say, last chance trash drop. So at that point you have dropped all your trash. You've thrown out your gel wrappers. You've thrown out your empty bottles, whatever it is you need to throw out. If it's anywhere else in the course and they see you littering, littering, you will get disqualified. So no littering. All right. So we've made it through the 2.4 mile swim. We've made it through the 112 mile bike. And now we get to the marathon. Um, this is probably the easiest mar well no marathon is easy this is probably the easiest course that you will ever encounter it's pretty much a straight line and it's very flat um you're just running straight down beach road you're making one right hand turn that you're going to just turn into go down a little ways do a u-turn and come straight down front beach road again on the way back and you're going to do that twice um, good aid stations, good spectators, very spectator friendly run course. Um, this weather, as I said early on, it's so unpredictable in Panama city. It could be freezing cold or it could be 90 degrees. It's just, I mean, if you're coming from the North and you're you just bring everything that you could possibly need for every season. Um, you know, obviously you're going to see the forecast ahead, but it, things can still change. It's usually last year was very cold, very windy all the way through the whole entire day. Um, the, it was a very cold run. It was a little unusual. It's usually not like that. Usually um, it's cold in the morning and it's cold at night, but the middle of the day when you're running, it's usually sunny and it's, it can get fairly warm. Um, so just kind of be prepared. 
Um, again, it's it's a fall race. The time changes this weekend of the race, so it changes um, that Saturday night going into Sunday morning. But it does get dark. It will get dark between five and five thirty pretty early, so the coolness will set in early. Um, yeah, that's it's pretty much aid stations every mile to mile and a half apart. The pacing for run day. So if you get off your bike and you see that your average on your heart rate was 130, your target for your run would be 135 to 140. So you want to try to be able to elevate your average heart rate five to 10 beats above wherever your bike fell. If you're using running power like the stride, you want it to you want to run your race approximately 70 to 80 percent of your critical power unless you're a very strong biker and runner, and then you can go up to 83 to 85% of your critical power. If you're using running pace, you want to use the first three miles to settle into that pace. You know, um, you know, by the end of your three miles, you should be into a pretty steady pace by that point. And if you feel like you're overheating, if it's a warm day, obviously slow your pace down. Again, RPE is just a pace, a conversational pace that you can hold for pretty much the whole day. Just a few little my own personal run strategies, things I personally do. Um, obviously, start slower than you plan on running. So, you know, you have 26 miles to run. So if you think, oh, you know, I, I, I'm going to be able to hold a 10 minute pace, um, maybe start at 1030. So just kind of start those first couple miles, work into it, warm up, because if you start too slow, you have a lot of miles to make up um, that pace to run a little bit faster. But if you start too fast and you die off, you're going to be walking a lot more miles than what you should be. So try to, you know, start a little bit conservatively because you have a lot of time to make up for that. Break the run into small parts. It's very daunting. Break the whole race actually into small parts. It's very daunting to stand on the shore of the swim and think, wow, I'm going to be covering 140.6 miles today. I, like, how am I even going to do that? So break everything into small chunks. So the swim, it's it's two loops or it's an out and back twice. Um, the run, I mean, the bike, it's, you know, aid station to aid station, or it's, you know, break, however you can break it into the, whatever chunks you need to break it into. Um, the run you can do, it's four runs. It's out one, it's back two, it's out three, and it's back to the finish line four. Um, or you can do it by 5k or 10k, however you want, whatever works, 26, one mile jogs, how, whatever works for you. Just don't look at the whole picture. Again, stay ahead of your nutrition and hydration. Um, walk through the aid stations of a brisk walk, not a stroll um, to make sure that you get your drinks and your gels down um, and then slow down. If your nutrition starts to fail, you start to get GI um, upset, just slow down. If you need to walk a little bit to get your stomach to calm down, sip some water or Coke <clears throat> until your GI stress passes. And it's here on this run course where you're going to experience your highest highs and your lowest lows for the day, especially after dark. Um, expect this is where it gets really tough, um, especially when it gets dark, people are walking. Um, this is really when you need to pull out all your mental strategies. You're, you're like, why, why, you know, I put an, a year into training for this race. I need to keep moving forward. Um, you know, people in wheelchairs would be grateful to be doing this right now. Just, you know, be grateful that you're there, like that you have the health, that you have the strength, that you have the financial means to be out there. And um, because, you know, this, that, that, those final miles of the run is where it's really tough. They always say a marathon is two um, races, the first 20 miles and then the last six. So just it, the farther along you get, the harder it gets. This is nothing any of us are going to have to worry about, but I have to put it in here. These are the cutoff times. Um, so again, 110 for the first loop, 220 for the full swim. There is a hard cutoff for everyone. Everyone has to complete all of the swim, T1, and the full bike course within 10 and a half hours. There's two soft cutoffs on the bike. Highway 79, which is the turnaround of like where I mentioned um, the Gulf Coast course. It's actually mile 69.9. Um, you have to be at that turnaround by 3.10 p.m. The second bike cutoff is at Gales Trails, which is the park, um, which is mile 96. And you have to be there by 5 o'clock in the evening. 
your final bike cutoff, you have to be in transition um, by 6 p.m. The run cutoffs, mile 13 special needs by 9.25 p.m. Mile 19, which is the turnaround on Surf Drive by 11 o'clock at night, you have to cross the finish line. I actually think it's 12.30 a month, but it might be 12.40. Um, and you personally have 17 hours to complete the full course. So it's not 17 hours from when the first person entered the water, it's 17 hours from when you entered the water. On your race day, keeping um, strong in your head, focus on your goals as your number one priority, um, goals that you have 100% control over. It's not the weather, it's not a mechanical issue, it's staying positive in your mind, it's your nutrition, and it's your pacing. Those are really the only things you have control over. Um, so make sure those things are your number one things you're focusing on, staying positive, staying on your pace and staying on your um, timing of your nutrition. Then secondly, you can focus on your targets, which is power, pace, and heart rate. And then um, stick to your plan, including how you react when something doesn't go according to plan. And something I promise you will not go according to plan because race day on Ironman is a very long morning, afternoon, and night. So something is gonna go awry I can almost promise what I like to think of is red light, yellow light, green light. So let's just say I have a mechanical on the bike. I'm try not to panic. The red light is stop and think things through in a calm manner. So you're going to stop. What am I going to do to fix this problem? Or what am I going to do to readjust my goal that I just, I just missed my swim cutoff that I thought I'd, I'd have, you know, I thought I was going to swim a 110 and I just swim a 130. Um, so stop and think through the problem and how you're going to fix it. Yellow light is fixing the problem in a calm way. So, okay, I have my mechanical. I figured out a solution on how I'm going to fix it. I'm calmly going to fix this problem. And green light is the problem is fixed. I'm going to go finish my day here. Um, getting upset or freaking out over a missed goal time or, or a mechanical or a cramp or a blister, it's only going to make things worse. So just try to remain calm. That's the best thing you can, you can do outcomes such as your pace, your time. If you're going to get a world championship slot, world championship slot, these are all left to the second half of the run. So mile 14 and onward, if even at all. Okay. So, as I said, everyone has a perfect day in their mind. And um, so everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And this usually happens at least once on Ironman. So you have this perfect day you've been picturing, you've been training for a year, you know, like all the things and how they're going to unfold on race day. And then something goes awry. So again, just expect that to happen. Race day tips. Expect again, expect the unexpected to happen because it will. Um, oh, wait, where are we going here? Um, the beauty of racing Ironman, I think personally is thinking on your feet when the unexpected happens. So Ironman is just, you know, it's just, it's a day of thinking through things, um, and, and figuring things out, letting them unfold, um, dealing with your problem or your issue or your unexpected event calmly readjusting your goals as needed. So we all, you know, even when we say like, you shouldn't have a time goal, we pretty much do. So let's just say, you know, you wanted to finish the bike in five hours and 45 minutes and you get off the bike at six hours and 15 minutes, you're like, okay, you know, I missed it by a half hour, but it's fine. I'm just, you know, going to move forward. And my new goal is now this. Um, and it's the athletes really, honestly, who deal with the unexpected situations in a calm and rational manner that make it to the finish line. So it's the ones who, um, when the unexpected things happen and they freak out and they panic and they're just like, oh, my day is ruined. I'm just going to quit now. Um, it's just, it's, that's not the attitude to have for Ironman day. Uh, race in the moment. So make sure at every moment you're controlling what you can control. You're thinking positively um, and you're not thinking back about the bad things that may have happened and you're not thinking forward about what could happen. So, oh my gosh, what if I get a blister at mile 20 on the run and I can't, you know, it's, it's hard to run because I have my whole toe as a blister or I get a cramp. Don't worry about it. Just 
rate, like worry about this moment right now that you're fueling, that you're staying positive and that you're staying on track. Um, and that's the best thing that you can do there. Again, don't worry. I just said this, don't worry about what has happened or what might happen. Only worry about what's happening right now. Um, breaking the race into small chunks, having a mantra or a thought or a vision to get you through the tough spots. And there's going to be a lot of tough spots, as I mentioned, um, you like, for example, like, oh, every time I pass through a, um, a street light, it's going to give me energy to keep moving forward. Or I'm, you know, I like some people like to dedicate like the first five miles of the run, I'm going to dedicate to my friend. And I'm going to think about memories that I had with her or my son or whatever it might be. Um, when you're going on that run course and unless you're uh, like in the content, your contender for a Kona slot, you know, take a moment to hug your kids and your family or your friends. It's, it's a tough day for spectators. It's long day and tiring for them. And they only get to see you for a couple of seconds here and there. So when you do see them, you know, pay them some attention, call out their name, give them a quick hug um, and, and make sure to pay them a little bit of attention. And just remember that having the health and the strength and the financial means, because a sport is very expensive, it's a gift. And we're blessed to get to do this. And remember that on race day, that we get to do this and we don't have to do this. It was our choice to be out here, to spend the money, to put the time in. And so appreciate the gift of being out there and racing. And your victory lap. Um, so we've spent, you know, six months to a year of training and thinking about this day. So take it all in, especially the finish line, enjoy it. Um, and especially if this is your first race, you never get another first race. You only get one. So enjoy every moment, even the tough ones. Um, the race can, you know, I actually said this already, but the race can be very daunting, um, at a lot of the times. So don't look at the big picture, break it into little small chunks, and race in the moment and be present and aware of your surroundings. And no matter how good you feel or how bad you feel, that feeling won't last for very long. So when you're feeling good, really embrace it. And when you're feeling bad, just try to get through it until you turn the corner and get back to feeling good again. And you finally made it to the finish loop, finish shoot. And this, this is obviously what we all imagine. Like the whole time we're training, like we imagine the finish line and hearing our name called out and you are an Ironman. It's exciting and it's amazing. So take a moment, you know, don't sprint through the finish line. Enjoy it. Slow down, take it in, make sure your bib number is showing so you can get your race pictures. Um, high five the crowd and the family, especially the kids they are all putting their hands out for you. Um, try to smile and enjoy it. And it's sometimes you're just so happy to be finished that you don't even listen. You, you imagine like this whole year, like, oh, you are an Ironman. And then you're just so grateful to be done that you don't even hear that said. So try to take a moment to listen. Um, you can get your post-race picture taken right at the finish line. There's a big um, screen you can stand in front of if you want with your medal and get a picture taken. And then most importantly, the finish line is very, very busy and crowded place have a post-race meeting spot planned out ahead of time. Like the day before the race, go say, okay, when I finish, meet me here. So find a certain spot, a tree, a sign, a place in, in, at the end of the finish line where your family or your friends are going to find you and meet you. Um, race day, just some time logistics. Um, your bike checkout that your friend or family member can get your bike or you have to go get your bike after you finish. It, it opens at 6.30 and it closes at 12.30 a.m. Um, make sure you do give your bike check out to someone, your ticket, if you want them to get that for you. Awards and roll downs are Sunday from 9 to 11 at Aaron Besant Park. The roll down for Kona slots are right after awards. If you are anywhere close, I mean, even in the top 20, just stay till the very end because sometimes roll downs go pretty far if you do want to go to Kona. If you do choose to go to Kona, if you get a spot or you get a roll down, you have to be present to claim your spot. So if you won your age group and you want to go to Kona, but you weren't there at the award ceremony, you don't get your slot. So make sure you show up. If you do choose to go to world championships, the entry fee is $1,400 now, and it has to be paid on the spot. So bring your credit cards. I was actually at an award ceremony once um, in France, 
And the person in front of us knew they were getting a slot and they had four credit cards in their hand to uh, divvy it out onto four different credit cards to pay for their entry fee. So just a little funny story. Um, finisher's tent. This is always fun. So on um, Sunday from seven to 12, you can show up and they change out some of the merchandise in the uh, finisher's tent. You can buy stuff that says actually like Iron Man Florida finisher 2022. So um, save your money. Don't spend it all in the days prior at the merchandise tent. Save some for that finisher's tent. Sunday, fun day. This is the best day ever, right? Um, so we've spent a long time. We've spent a lot of money um, training for this race. So um, just make sure you enjoy your Sunday. You know, just think back to the year of like how much food money we've spent on food and, and nutrition and laundry detergent and all the work we've put in and really enjoy Sunday. Um, I always like, like to remember that. And I was told after my first Ironman, like my body gave me a gift to get me through Ironman. And so I needed to give my body a gift back into return. And I've always remembered that, like, it's really a miracle that our bodies can actually do all this. So think, you know, do something nice to thank your body in return, whether it's a massage or a nice meal, just something, something nice for yourself. Um, and use Sunday to celebrate you. You did it. Like, so spend time with your family and friends, eat all the food, share your race stories um, with your, you know, your other friends who raced and just make the day be super special and fun. We definitely deserved it. All right. Now questions. Hopefully I didn't take like 10 hours on this. Yeah, I took a long time. Sorry. All right, do we have any questions? I think there was one in the chat box earlier. And it was actually, it was a comment. It was at Ironman Maryland this year. We still needed the QR code from active.com email. And that comes out um, race week for check-in, but that you don't okay. have to a check-in time. Okay. That might be accurate. I was told from someone that they were not doing that. And it was just to show up now. So it could go either way. So watch for the email because maybe it'll come. But again, I was personally told from someone that it's now back to just showing up. So kind of look, look for both things. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? You can type them into the chat box. Feel free to come off mute if you want to. All right. I don't on. have a question. But I don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank you so much. That was the best presentation oh, I've oh. ever heard. Oh, thanks. Thank you so Seriously. much. I'm glad. Hopefully it helped. Thanks. It's incredible. I'm going to send it to anybody I know that does an Ironman because it's <laughs> okay. so good. So thank awesome. you. Thank you. And good luck. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending this. This webinar was recorded. It will be available on the QT2 Systems YouTube site and do feel free to watch it again, share the link with anyone um, that you think might be interested. And yeah, there was a lot of really good information, not just for this race, but for any, um, any Ironman. So thank you very much, Jackie. And oh, um, so Allison welcome. said um, it was just showing up at whatever time in Ironman Maryland, but you still need the QR code. So I guess watch those QR codes. All right. Well, have a great race, everyone, including you, Coach Thanks, Jackie. Guys. Thank you. Right. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thanks for your help, Reem. Okay. Good night.